Well, good evening. Uh, I'm Bob Glauber. Uh, I'm a member of the faculty here at the Kennedy School and of its uh, Masafar Romani Center for Business and Government. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome all of you to this year's lecture, which is funded by NASD, which is now FINRA, uh, the private sector regulator of the U.S. brokerage industry. Focus of this series of lectures is on financial regulation, uh, and each year we have had a leading public official responsible in some way uh, for U.S. financial regulation. Uh, this year, our speaker is a tiny bit of a stretch, but really not much at all. Uh, Ed Haldeman was CEO of Freddie Mac uh, from mid-2009 uh, to just a few months ago. While in that role, Ed was not formally a public regulator, uh, he was responsible for running a very large public financial institution. Uh, Freddie Mac and its sibling, Fannie Mae, are what are called government-sponsored uh, entities, uh, GSEs, uh, for years described as private companies with a public mission of supporting housing, or more simply, as mixed public-private enterprises. But in September 2008, both institutions failed financially uh, and were placed in government conservatorship, becoming quite unmixed, just public corporations. The GSEs have had many problems uh, prior to their conservatorship. Uh, Ed was not part of that, arriving about a year after conservatorship. Uh, but Ed was part of the solution. The task of running Freddie Mac is a big challenge. It's a very large business with about 5,000 people and with a balance sheet at its peak before conservatorship of just under a trillion dollars. Uh, that included about $800 billion of mortgages financed directly by Freddie and another $1.7 trillion of mortgages guaranteed but off balance sheet. Uh, together with Fannie Mae, uh, Freddie was responsible for roughly half of the U.S. mortgages made to homeowners. Since conservatorship, uh, the uh, amount of mortgages directly on the balance sheets of Freddie and Fannie have declined, uh, but their role in financing uh, U.S. Uh, home ownership has in fact shot up. Today, roughly three quarters of U.S. mortgages are made or guaranteed by Freddie and Fannie. I had a bit of a role in attracting Ed to run Freddie after it was placed in conservatorship. I was on the Freddie Mac board, head of its governance and nominating committee. Uh, the first CEO of Freddie, uh, who was put in place by the Treasury Department at the time of conservatorship, quit after six months. Uh, we had to make a pitch to Ed to take the job. It was fairly simple, uh, a most challenging job, which was a dramatic understatement, but the opportunity to do meaningful public service. Uh, Freddie and Fannie needed very strong leadership and steady guidance as they rehabilitated themselves and waited for the government to decide just what to do with them. I should point out that we're still waiting for the government to decide just what to do with them. It's now four years since conservatorship. And beyond uh, some partisan back and forth about banks' handling of foreclosures, housing policy has been one of the elephants in the room during the campaign. Ed has had an outstanding career in both public and pri private sector, uh, leading important financial institutions. After degrees from Dartmouth, HBS, and the Harvard Law School, Ed started his career at, with a Philadelphia investment counseling firm, Cook & Beeler. Cook & Beeler was later bought by a Boston financial firm called United Asset Management, which Ed eventually ran. From there, he went on to become chairman and CEO of Delaware Investments, a large mutual fund management company. And next, he was called in to run Putnam Investments here in Boston, an even larger mutual fund management firm that had experienced some regulatory failings by the previous management. He righted that ship and eventually sold Putnam at a very good price for its shareholders to a large Canadian financial firm. It was at that time that we approached Ed to run Freddie. 
Freddie and Fannie, together with the broader issues of U.S. government involvement in, the ho in housing finance, is one of the major unfinished pieces of business in financial regulatory reform. Uh, it's clearly an important issue. We have C-SPAN here tonight uh, filming this. Uh, Ed has a unique perspective on that issue, the perspective of an experienced manager on the front line running one of the GSEs and a most thoughtful public policy participant. This evening he's going to talk about where the GSEs have been and what to do with them. It's my great pleasure uh, to introduce Ed Haldeman. Bob, thanks so much for that kind introduction. I'm very appreciative of so many of you coming out tonight to uh, visit with me and learn about Freddie Mac and the GSEs. I'm particularly pleased to be giving the Glauber Lecture here tonight. Um, there are many, many people, perhaps hundreds, maybe it would even number in the thousands, of people whose career was launched by Bob Glauber. I'm one of those. Bob Glauber taught me investment management in 1973 at Harvard Business School, and then, as he indicated, I spent uh, approximately 35 years in the money management industry. So I don't distinguish myself based on my career being launched by Bob Glauber, but what I think is a little bit special about me, perhaps unique, is that my career began and ended with Bob Glauber. <laughs> and um, since, um, particularly this week, I think I ought to be careful about the preposition I used in that last clause because Bob was on the board, I was the CEO, and the preposition I used was my career ended with Bob, not by Bob. And um, I think this week particularly, uh, I'm sensitive to um, making sure everybody knows that we, we ended our, our time at Freddie Mac together. Um, I'm also pleased that the subject of the Glauber Lecture tonight is Freddie Mac and the GSEs so that I have an opportunity, uh, now that I'm no longer the CEO of Freddie Mac, have an opportunity uh, to present a balanced view of the GSEs. Uh, this is a subject, that is Freddie Mac, the GSEs, uh, which I have come to see others speak uh, very uh, aggressively, uh, emotionally. It, it's a subject that gets very heated, and it is very uh, uncommon uh, for people to present a, a balanced view. In fact, my goal tonight uh, is to present a balanced view of the GSEs, and if I succeed, I think it may be the first time that there has ever been a balanced presentation about the, the GSEs. Uh, Certainly, uh, the employees that worked with me uh, were passionate about uh, the ro their role, the function that they performed. Almost uh, a relig religious kind of mission is what they felt they were doing at Freddie Mac. And it was hard to uh, imagine that there were other people in society that had the same kind of uh, visceral feel in the opposite direction about the work that they that they did, and neither side able to see uh, the other point of view. Hopefully, in the course of the next 15 minutes or so, uh, you will come to a, a balanced opinion about Freddie Mac and the, and the GSEs. I want to start with where they've been, and I'm going to go back quite a bit in time, back to uh, 1938, uh, when the first GSE was created, Fannie Mae, to think about what the mortgage market was like at that point in time, because I think by doing so, we'll see some of the advantages and good things that have been accomplished by uh, Freddie Fannie and the GSEs. Uh, before Fannie, uh, the mortgage market was very different than it is today. The only thing that was available were sh very short-term mortgages, five or ten years, variable kinds of rates. A down payment, 50 percent, was the standard in those days. Um, there was a bullet payment at the end of the term. You had to come up with the whole thing at, at the end of the, this short uh, term. Very large variations regionally with regard to availability of mortgage money and, and rate. No standardization 
in terms of underwriting at all, all done very locally with very different standards. And the mortgage market was not at all connected to the capital market, and as a result, rates were quite high in those days. Subsequently, the mortgage market has changed radically, and I think in large part because of Freddie Fannie and the GSEs. Uh, most importantly, the mortgage market got highly connected to the capital markets. The secondary mortgage function performed by the GSEs connected the mortgage market to large pools of assets, the capital markets, including not just in the U.S., but worldwide. There was standardization in underwriting that was required by the GSEs, uh, virtually an elimination of the uh, variability in rates and liquidity by uh, region. There was a broadening out in the access to mortgage money in our country. Uh, before, very limited in terms of very high income people, uh, very limited in terms of ethnic background. The GSEs broadened that out substantially and most importantly uh, made sure there was widespread, widespread availability of fixed rate 30-year mortgages. Think about what what is so special about mortgages in our country. Today, for about a 3.5% interest rate, you can get 30-year money with no prepayment penalty, a pretty unusual uh, economic opportunity. So those are the early years, the advantages that GSEs um, uh, brought to the mortgage market. Let's now think about the years just before the financial crisis and think about where the GSEs have been in that period of time. And the reason that it's worthwhile taking a look at this time just before the financial crisis is that there are many people who have argued and written that the GSEs caused the financial crisis, were the cause of the Great Recession. And uh, as Bob Glauber indicated, I was not at Freddie Mac until way after the financial crisis, so I don't really have a stake in this game. But this is a chart that I would look at to sort of determine to what extent I thought Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, caused the crisis. And again, I'm not saying that there, perhaps we'll find later some contribution, but do you think they caused it? And this chart looks at market shares. And the market share of the GSEs uh, is at the top. And uh, it's that blue line. And then the reddish line that starts at the bottom and gets very high in 05, 07 is the private market private secondary mortgage market. So this is the, the uh, investment banks and the commercial banks issuing uh, secondary MBS securities, private label securities, we call them. And look at that radical market share change. Freddie and Fannie going from on the order of 75% down to 40%, falling like a rock and the private label taking tremendous share. What would be the cause of that? Cause, in my view, is a change in underwriting standards, a change from requiring substantial documentation and high underwriting standards, uh, large down payments. Many of the private capital competitors uh, reduced some of those standards and were able to take substantial market share. Now imagine uh, you are the CEO of Freddie Mac at the bottom market share number, 40%. You've seen your market share for the two GSEs go from 75% down to 40%. Do you react or not? Do you change your underwriting standards? How much can you tolerate in terms of market share loss? Uh, as a CEO of Freddie Mac, I had five or 6,000 employees. Uh, it looks like the entire market is going away from me. Do I change or not? And I think that uh, the CEOs, the people running the company, did make some changes. Uh, and we each can make our judgment about what we would have done in that position. But I'd at least argue it's a hard call. It would not be easy to be unchanged in terms of your requirements on down payment, underwriting standards, and have that market share uh, go completely away uh, like that. 
This is another indication of, I believe, whether or not uh, Freddie uh, was the cause of the financial crisis. And here we take a look at mortgage default rates over time. Uh, the definition of default is 90 days um, delinquent. And you can see that um, at Freddie and Fannie, at the worst, our delinquency rate got up into the 4 to 5 percent zone. For the overall mortgage market in our country, it got to be 10 percent. And for the subprime sector of the market, it got up to be 25 percent. So again, while I believe that Freddie and Fannie did lower their standards, uh, look at the resulting delinquency rates, um, and I think you can see a big difference between the way Freddie and Fannie behaved and the way the rest of the industry uh, did. So um, where I've come out on this is that um, I don't believe that the two GSEs were the cause of the financial crisis. I do think they did uh, reduce underwriting standards, but I think I can understand why as a CEO you might have done that uh, given what the competition was doing. I do think there were some mistakes and, and problems made uh, that were connected to the GSEs, and certainly one that I found troubling uh, was summarized in a book by Gretchen Morganson called uh, Reckless Endangerment, which is a story of crony capitalism uh, exhibited by the two GSEs. And... Um, I, I view that book almost as a playbook on how businesses uh, can execute crony capitalism and get close to uh, government uh, for their benefit, uh, not just uh, an incredible lobbying organization, not just massive ca uh, campaign contributions, but things like uh, hiring repeatedly uh, people coming out of government, opening regional offices in all of the critical congressional offices and hiring relatives of congressmen um, in order to uh, uh, fill those regional offices. So to be sure, uh, some of the criticism that, that Gretchen Morgenstern offers is, is, is accurate. Uh, a second problem uh, was the implied government guarantee. Um, this was not something that necessarily um, was generated by the GSEs, but rather they took advantage of it. But what they were able to do because of the implied government guarantee was borrow essentially as much money as they wanted to uh, at the government rate. So unlike most private companies, uh, when you put on more and more de debt, the, the rate goes up, they were able to borrow almost unlimited amounts at the government uh, rate and then create a retained portfolio, uh, which some people have described as a hedge fund because one was able to arbitrage the difference between the government rate and um, the rate that they used to buy, uh, in some cases, private label securities. So um, I don't think uh, the GSEs are with, without fault, uh, but um, I do think it, it is a stretch to call them the cause of the financial crisis. So let's talk about what the GS, GSEs have done uh, subsequent uh, to the crisis uh, since they put, put into conservatorship. That's the point in time that I'm more familiar with. And one of the things that they have done, and one of the reasons I took the job, is that they have been the only game in town for the mortgage market. Uh, and here the, the numbers um, uh, accounting for uh, 75 percent of the total mortgage market. If you add in FHA, another government uh, mortgage provider, you get to about 95 percent. So the private market has been providing only about 5 percent of the mortgage money. Uh, where would we have been over the past three or four years uh, without the GSEs performing this uh, function? Uh, in addition, uh, we worked with the administration and the Treasury Department in order to execute some of the government programs. HAMP and HARP are the names, Home Affordable 
um, modification program and home affordable refinance uh, uh, program. Um, and you can see that um, uh, the number of modifications done uh, since conservatorship is 1.2 million homes, um, a big number. The only problem with that number is when the idea of modifications was first generated, uh, they, the program was quickly taken over by political people uh, in and close to the White House, and they decided that they needed to make an announcement of what HAMP was going to do, and they said it was going to do three or four million modifications. I have no idea how anybody got that number, but somebody wanted a big number, uh, and as a result, 1.2 has always seemed um, like it wasn't very successful. It's a pretty big uh, number, and the GSEs executed um, not just the modification program, but also the refinance uh, program. One of the things we didn't do uh, was we didn't do uh, principal forgiveness. And that is a, uh, I'm not quite ready for this one, so, but uh, on this list of things up here, um, we didn't do principal forgiveness. And some of you have read criticism about us not doing uh, principal uh, forgiveness. Uh, we believe pretty strongly, as did our regulator, that um, there was a real risk of strategic defaults uh, were we to offer a program of principal forgiveness, which is to say that um, even though uh, Freddie has lots of um, underwater mortgages, um, over 80% of them are still current. Nobody's had any problem or has continued to make their um, obligation despite being underwater. Uh, we worried about the, um, principal forgiveness having some impact on those 80% of the underwater uh, mortgages, and we thought it better to focus our attention on um, HAMP and, and HARP rather than add uh, principal forgiveness. I um, wanted to spend just a minute on another part of our record uh, subsequent to conservatorship, which would be profitability. Um, many of you have read about Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae being a black hole. Um, the record uh, in front of you uh, shows two bars. One is the amount of uh, draw that we have taken from the federal government, and the green bar is the amount of dividends paid. And what a lot of people don't recognize is that the dividends that we have to pay now are a number like $7.2 billion a year. So if you generated $7 billion in income, you'd still have to draw something from the government. And that's why people continue to talk about draws. If you look at that total record for the entire time of conservatorship, the round numbers are a draw from the government of $70 billion and dividends of $20 billion, meaning a net draw of 50. And you can see in 2008, when that year was done, the draw was $48 billion. So almost everything subsequent to 2008 has been a draw required to pay a dividend. That is a net neutral impact on the, on the Treasury. And the reason we've been able to uh, get to that level of profitability is that all the mortgages that have been put on in the past four years during conservatorship have been very high quality uh, in terms of uh, down payment and in terms of FICO score, much higher than was the case uh, prior to conservatorship. And this new book, the stuff subsequent to uh, conservatorship, now accounts for over 60% of the total book of Freddie Mac. So let's switch. So that was all past. We, we talked about the real old time period, uh, 1938. We took a look at the pre-crisis uh, period, and we've looked at post-conservatorship. Let's now look forward and think about what to do uh, with Freddie Mac going forward. Uh, it has been a great frustration to me uh, that uh, the Treasury Department and the administration has come up with uh, no program policy or recommendations as to what to do. Uh, it is now 50 months that we've been into conservatorship. It is now 50 months that 6,000 people who work at Freddie Mac don't know if the company's going to exist. They have no job security at all. Uh, the, the Treasury was to put out a position paper in January 2010 with a suggested solution. They didn't do that. It didn't come until January 2011, and then the white paper 
listed just three options, three options that would have been obvious to anyone on day one of conservatorship. So it's a great frustration that we've made no progress in this area, particularly when I believe there is strong consensus on what we ought to do. Before you is a uh, proposal that was put forward in August of 2009 um, um, by the Mortgage Bankers Association, uh, which talks about um, forming companies, private capital companies that they called McGs, mortgage credit guarantee entities, uh, which would be three to five in number, that would be private capital companies that would compete with one another that there would be no government guarantee of the companies, there would be a government guarantee of the securities, the mortgage-backed securities, but for that guarantee, the McGees would pay an insurance premium, uh, much like FDIC insurance. Uh, the um, securitization would only be uh, of plain vanilla kind of mortgages. Anything exotic would have to be done in the private uh, capital uh, market, um, and there would be no retained portfolio at all. So we had this proposal, a sensible proposal in my view, in August of 2009. Three years later, a uh, really smart guy named Jim Milstein, who was at the Treasury Department, he's the guy who's responsible for the restructuring of AIG. Uh, he is a lawyer and uh, investment banking restructuring kind of uh, person, and uh, he put out a proposal which has many uh, common ingredients that we saw from the Mortgage Bankers Association. Uh, here the emphasis is on a government agency, the Federal Mortgage Insurance Corporation, which um, authorizes, management, manages, regulates a series of securitizers who issue mortgage-backed securities, and again, the companies are not guaranteed, just the securities are. Um, and the beauty of both of these proposals is that the uh, t technology and the infrastructure and the systems and the human capital of the GSEs would not be wasted, but could form the basis of one of these securitizers that would compete in the private capital market uh, going forward. So I believe uh, that there has been some consensus around a proposal that is feasible would work. It, one was issued by somebody who had an axe to grind, that is the Mortgage, Mortgage Bankers Association, but Milstein coming from the Treasury Department, uh, presumably his view is what's best for the economy, but it's a very similar kind of proposal uh, in my uh, estimation, and uh, uh, I wish that we could uh, move ahead with something like this, and it would be a uh, tremendous um, uh, benefit, I think, for the taxpayers to get some usefulness out of this investment that they have made in the GSEs and keeping them uh, together and functioning, to use the skeleton, to use the infrastructure in a, in a way uh, that allows uh, uh, the taxpayer to get a, a benefit, to get some monetization of the investment that has been made o over, over time. So in summary, um, uh, uh, on this where should we go, um, I think the most important thing is to, is to go somewhere soon. Um, it is um, incredibly challenging to work at Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae to have this uh, uncertainty, to not know whether you have a future. Uh, it is debilitating over time. These entities are becoming less corporate-like and more government-like, and uh, from my point of view, um, that's, that's regrettable. So I hope I've given you some insight into where we've been with the GSEs, where I think we ought to go, and I'd be interested in uh, your questions. Bob? Uh, great. Thank you, Ed. Uh, let me just remind all of you of the ground rules. We ask you to identify yourself, and we ask you to do something very simple, to ask a question uh, rather than make a speech, and that the question be reasonably contained. Uh, I'm going to, to ask the first question. Uh, you've said where you'd like to go. You've said, Ed, you're concerned that nobody's gone there yet. 
have any forecast of just when you think Congress is going to go somewhere and what the process will look like? Yeah. Um, I made my decision to uh, leave Freddie Mac because I thought it was going to take a long time before we would get uh, resolution, unfortunately. I joined the company um, in the middle of 2009, uh, and at that point, uh, everyone was essentially certain that the company would be relaunched in some form um, in, in a couple years. And um, obviously, we've been disappointed in, in that. And as the calendar rolled through three or four years, I concluded looking at my birth certificate that I probably wasn't going to make it. Um, and uh, that was one indication of um, my pessimism about uh, when we were going to get this resolved. Um, clearly, it was clear to all of us that as we got into the election year that nobody was going to spend any time on it. And it's been remarkable how silent uh, the two candidates have been on this subject, given how much is at stake. Um, and I think once we get uh, the election over and get the new Congress established, they've got um, an agenda uh, with more uh, significant things uh, like uh, tax policy and like policy on the uh, deficits. Uh, so I think there's going to be um, – we're going to have to wait a good long period longer before we get any – uh, kind of action on, on this. And then there's the implementation delay. I, I'm just talking about when somebody puts out an idea which has to be challenged and fought with in, in Congress and debated, and then you get something passed, and then you've got your implementation. Uh, after all, think about where we are in terms of implementation on uh, Dodd-Frank, where we are in implementation in terms of Obamacare. Uh, I, I'm unfortunately uh, very pessimistic about uh, when we finally get resolution. Okay, let's start with the questions. Yes, sir. Uh, hi, I'm hi. Ryan Kennedy. I'm a student at Harvard Business School and Harvard Kennedy School. Um, you started your remarks talking about the incredible political influence that uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac had uh, before their conservatorship. Um, as we think about the entities that will follow, how do we think about creating the appropriate amount of political insulation against uh, lobbying when it comes to things like capital requirements or appropriately pricing the government's guarantee? Yeah, that, that's a, a real struggle. Um, um, I could tell you that during my time, um, during the conservatorship, uh, we had really strong restrictions on us. We were not able to make any political contributions, not just at the corporate level, but I personally was not able to do it. I happened to go to um, uh, law school with a couple sitting senators. I wasn't able to visit with them even in a personal uh, sense. So it precluded from any interaction with any member of Congress whatsoever. I, if I was going to go to the Hill, had to go with our regulator. Uh, we, uh, before I got there, when we were placed in the conservatorship initially, all the lobbying uh, was stopped and the, the lobbying people were, were let go. So we, during this period of time, you should know that uh, I, I can tell you that um, it has been totally insulated with a couple exceptions, which were really annoying to me, which were uh, Congress, a, a member of Congress, um, who felt like they owned Freddie Mac, like they owned me, uh, would call on my personal cell phone. I don't know how they got it, uh, trying to make me intercede on some action that the company was about to take in her, in her district, presumably uh, some kind of a um, uh, 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 foreclosure kind of activity that had gone through the process. I was asked to in intercede. So there, there was an attempt in that di direction, and all of that makes me a little bit uh, pessimistic about your, your question. I think when we get to the resolution, um, uh, one would hope that we would have these uh, private capital companies uh, which would be uh, regulated very closely uh, with restrictions on uh, um, campaign contributions, lobbying, that kind of, uh, of thing. Uh, but we're also going to have to have strong 
leadership at those things who don't uh, buckle to the pressures that, that, that they receive. But it, it is a problem, and uh, I, don't, I, I guess the reason that um, I'm not too pessimistic is because uh, we have gone through this period of time where the two GSEs have been incredibly disciplined about, about avoiding uh, involvement in political activity. You also talked about the discipline of the GSEs during this period and the quality of the mortgages that they have guaranteed. Uh, have you come under any pressure to ease that, that stringency did, did during this period? Um, very, very uh, modest. Um, and um, uh, there would obviously be statements made by, um, by members of the uh, Treasury Department administration um, su suggesting that we were uh, too tight or the other place that we would get a little bit of pressure is how aggressively we took the putbacks to, uh, to uh, financial institutions. Uh, but uh, very, very modest, I'd say, and, and, and reasonable, not particularly troubling. I'm Amanda Benton. I'm a student here at the Kennedy School. Um, I really liked your charts, and everything was very helpful. It looked like they focused primarily on the uh, single-family side of things. I'm interested to hear what you think about sort of the status and outlook for the multifamily portfolio. Good. Thank you for that. I'm going to grab a sip of water. I, this is the second time I've spoken since the vice presidential uh, debate, and as a result, every time I sip some water, I wonder whether it's too much or too little or whether it's appropriate or, or not. Um, so multifamily is a real um, great story at, uh, at Freddie Mac. It turns out it's about 10% uh, of our business, uh, but it's a very, very uh, successful business, and um, it's one where uh, we have had, uh, you know, I showed you the chart on the single-family delinquencies, and we're real low relative to the industry overall, half as much, no matter what time period you look at. Uh, the multifamily business had an infinitesimal default rate consistently throughout the whole thing, maintained high profitability throughout, uh, such that uh, many people, uh, industry kinds of people, uh, um, have been anxious for that business to be spun out individually as a standalone kind of business. And it, that, that is a, uh, uh, um, uh, something that is... Uh, feasible and another way that taxpayers could uh, receive money. But we, uh, I'm really proud of the effort that we had at, in multifamily at, at Freddie Mac. It's a great, great team uh, um, and uh, I think uh, could be uh, a very, very successful standalone company go going forward. Please. Uh, hello. I'm asking this question on the behalf of the JFK Junior Forum Committee. Um, in the current revision of the Freddie Mae and Fannie Mac bailouts, would you say that those companies have lost the ability to recapitalize themselves? Um, I think in the traditional way of using the word recapitalize themselves, yes, because of the 10% dividend requirement. So um, there, uh, when most TARP institutions got money, to use your word, a bailout, um, there was a 5% dividend uh, with um, an ability uh, to repay that. At uh, Freddie and Fannie, the dividend was 10% with no ability to repay. So as a result of that, the ability to recapitalize themselves, to use your phrase, uh, really isn't uh, there. And, um, uh, and, and I mean, the numbers um, for Freddie Mac are that the total draw in round numbers is like $72 billion, meaning that the dividend payment <coughs> annually is 7.2. So really, really hard to generate enough capital to meet that dividend and then accumulate on your balance sheet so that you would have a chance of recapitalization. Hi, I'm Sumit Malik. I'm a senior at the college. Thanks so much for taking the time. You began your talk by discussing some of the important advances in the mortgage market after the introduction of GSEs. And I wanted to know, in your opinion, in the modern society and looking forward, to what extent do you think a more 
purely private sector driven solution is able to or would be able to achieve the public goals of the GSEs? Yeah, so let's hypothesize no government involvement. You, you'll remember that the um, uh, suggestion that I made had what I think is limited government involvement, right? A, a private, say five private capital companies, um, none of which are too big to fail, none of whom have a government guarantee, but the securities, the mortgage-backed securities that they issue would be government guaranteed and there would be a, um, a, an insurance premium paid for that guarantee. So that, that's the extent of the uh, government. Um, let's hypothesize now to go to your question that there is no uh, ultimate reinsurance, ultimate government backstop of the securities. The disadvantages to that, I think, um, are largely in the cost of mortgages. And um, I believe that uh, the mortgage rates would be materially higher as compared to my suggestion. And the reason is that I think there are big sources of capital worldwide that will only invest in our housing mortgage market uh, if there is some kind of ultimate government backstop. I think there are big pools of, of assets in, uh, in Asia, for example, that will only in, invest uh, if there is an ultimate government backstop. I visited uh, during my tenure with some of the holders um, uh, of uh, Freddie Mac securities uh, from foreign institutions, and uh, they said they would not hold, they would not buy anymore, and were reducing their holdings because even under the current um, state of affairs, they weren't exactly comfortable with the ultimate. Uh, government guarantee, and they made it clear that how significant it was to have that guarantee if they were going to invest big pools of assets in our housing uh, market. So for that reason, I'm willing to tolerate that limited amount of government involvement. Thank you. Eric. You just said that without government involvement, there would be a higher uh, price for mortgages. Uh, and I, I'll bet that's right. I think everybody would agree that the consequence of, of just letting the, the private market uh, do this would be higher mortgage costs. Uh, what would be the consequences of that, and would those consequences be good, bad, or, or not matter? The consequences of the higher rates? Yeah. Um, well, I think they would be um, uh, significant. I think um, that... Um, Already, um, we are going to narrow down the universe of p possible home buyers um, uh, because the uh, down payments are so large. And then, if you compound that with a higher interest rate, we're just going to narrow that potential universe of home buyer down to a level which I think is. Uh, unacceptable in American society. And I, I, um, I, we, we definitely went too far in, towards the goal of making everybody a homeowner. Uh, we had that single-minded objective of getting that percentage higher and higher, and I think we pushed too hard. Uh, but I, I, I think that if you compound uh, a 20 percent down payment with uh, significantly higher mortgage rates, um, uh, I think we would be narrowing the universe of home buyers uh, into too small a group. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Jacob Morello, and I'm a sophomore here at the college. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the climate and culture um, that you experienced when you assumed leadership in 2009, considering all that had transpired in the months before. Um, kind of what were the expectations and pressures that you faced? Yeah. It, um, um, try and describe it a little bit. Um, so there are um, five or 6,000 people that work at this company. Um, many of them, like people employed anywhere in our society, had invested a lot of their money in the company. Their 401k um, had stock holdings. Many people 
uh, are proud of the company they work for, and so they buy stock in, in their company, and their holdings went to zero. So not saying everybody had 100% of the 401k in Freddie Mac stock, but there were big holdings that went to zero. And then the people um, were criticized by politicians and the press as being the cause of the financial crisis. These are people who literally believe that with a, they were doing great work helping people. And somebody accuses them of the financial crisis. Many of the employees told me that when they would wear uh, a Freddie Mac T-shirt or sweatshirt to the supermarket or the Home Depot, they would be accosted uh, by people um, for what they had done. Um, as Bob indicated, they were put in a conservatorship, and um, six months after the CEO arrived in conservatorship, he left. Two months after he left, the person who was the chief financial officer, age 42, um, took his own life. He didn't do anything. Uh, there was no fraudulent activity but this, because of the, of the stress. So the employees had that list of, of, of thoughts and pressures with no job security, no idea whether the company was going to exist. Remember that there were um, senior uh, politicians who repeatedly told the press that Freddie Mac should be abolished. In the white paper that the Treasury put out, they said many, many, many times that the company should be uh, wound down. And those were what the friends of the GSEs said. Uh, imagine the morale of the, of the, the people. Uh, um, and uh, because of that, um, I tried to spend uh, as much time as I could uh, being visible and, and talking to them and trying to come up uh, with um, hope for the future, which was around this notion of us getting ready for relaunching the company in some, some form. And um, um, the good news is that the, the people hung in there and they uh, continue to work hard and the, the company is uh, functioning quite well. Hi, um, my name's Josh. I'm a student here at the Kennedy School, and I wanted to ask you for your perspective on, um, or your reaction to the perspective of Raghu Rajan in his book, Fault Lines, um, when he, amongst other things, talks about, it calls for a need for cycle-proof regulation, when he observes that we come up with these great ideas, ideas like you articulated and outlined very well. We come up with those at this time in the cycle, but then in better times, they get dismembered and, and political pressure is, is applied to them under what he calls credit populism. And so he kind of says that we need to figure out ways to build regulation that somehow that won't happen to. They're immune to those pressures. Any thoughts on how we can do that? No, it's a, it's a, it's a great uh, thought. And uh, um, I'll be only partially facetious when I say uh, one of the best ways I know to... Um, uh, prevent the problem you're talking about is to make sure that there are people around who have lived through many, many cycles, who have seen the movie uh, before. And um, um, uh, I know that's uh, true in the investment business where I spent most of my, my time um, that um, uh, the... the, the uh, enthusiasm uh, builds and builds and builds and um, and people become more and more aggressive as as things go up and up and up and they inevitably reverse themselves and uh, it seems like a new generation needs to go through that before they they believe it so I think w experience and and people um, uh, having people on, on staffs, regulatory authorities, or at companies who have gone through uh, a few cycles is, is one uh, great thing to ha have there. And then I think uh, trying to insulate regulators uh, from the political process 
is, is really an important thing uh, to do. And we certainly didn't get that right at the GSEs. And if you haven't read Reckless Endangerment, you really should do it because you, you can see how th there was an attempt made to take the teeth out of the regulator uh, because if they, if they got too aggressive, could just call uh, people on the Hill and they would th intervene. So uh, those are two thoughts I have on, on how you might be able to accomplish that goal. Thank you. Got to end at seven, so let me take one last question. Scott. Uh, Scott Leland, I'm a staff member at the Center for Business and Government here at the Kennedy School. First, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, a question on the campaign. Uh, you said that there's a proposal from the Treasury in, in terms of how to, uh, what to do next with the GSEs, and presumably an Obama administration would, would follow something along those lines after dealing with the fiscal cliff and tax reform and all the other issues that are on the agenda. What about a Romney uh, uh, administration? Uh, what, what sorts of proposals, if any, have, have been articulated? Yeah, so Scott, let me make it clear that I did not say that there had been a proposal by the administration. They produced a long-awaited white paper in January 2011, which laid out three options. Uh, those options were a private solution, a government solution, or a hybrid solution. Uh, I'm not being very facetious here in, uh, in, in saying that. Um, uh, so uh, we haven't had a proposal from either side. Um, I uh, Historically, um, uh, I would expect uh, that a Democratic administration uh, would see some of the good things that the GSEs have provided, they'd go back to my opening charts about how the mortgage market has changed because of that and want to keep uh, something like them around. And I think that the Republican administration, uh, if it came in, uh, would want to go more to a uh, free market uh, kind of solution without any GSEs. I would hope that the suggestion I made uh, and the Mortgage Bankers Association made and Jim Milstein made would be seen as something that both sides could live with in that it is largely a private capital solution. There, aren't, there isn't a Freddie, there isn't a Fannie, there isn't this hybrid. There's a private, there are five private capital companies that are competing who have the ability uh, to pay a premium in order to get a government guarantee of, of their underlying se securities. I would hope that that would seem enough of a free market solution that the Republicans would be okay with it and uh, enough of, uh, of, of a protection of, um, of, of the uh, housing market that the Democratic um, uh, uh, folks might, might find it acceptable. Okay? Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Bob.